welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today um, for during your lunch hour. Um, my name is uh, Karen Spielman and I'm the science director at Shuma Archaeological Research and Education Center. Um, some of you I, I know, some of you I know your names, but maybe haven't met you. Um, and then I see some new names too, so I'm really excited to um, get to share with you sort of my passion and our organization's passion for preserving the rock art of the Lower Pecos. Um, you know, I'm just going to start and talk about my title slide and this image that's on my title slide. Um, let's see if I do the laser pointer, it might show up a little bit better. There, so we have this um, anthropomorph here, and um, he has, it's a human-like figure, he has um, this is at Halo Shelter, by the way, um, one of the sites that we're focusing on with our new project. Um, and I'm not only showing you the top half of him, but he has this sort of beautifully um, dashed outline body on one side, his fingers, his wrist decorations, one red and one black. Um, he has an elaborate, it has an elaborate headdress with red deer antlers and black dots on the tine and then um, holding a black addle addle or spear thrower with finger loops and, and decorations. And it's loaded with a dart um, here that has a feather fletching. And um, so my point with this is if you're, you know, he's also holding extra dart, tier red darts with the feather fletching and an elaborate staff. Here's the, the B stretch image to help you see that. Um, and, you know, a lot of you are familiar with Lower Pecos Rock Art, but for people who are not, I really like to point out all the details and the intricacies in the rock art um, because, you know, it's looking with those eyes to see all of those details. Um, this is a figure that we're very interested in knowing the age of at Halo Shelter, and um, we're hoping to go back um, and um, get a very small sample from this figure so that we can um, get a radiocarbon date for it. Um, and that's part of the Hearthstone project um, because this is a figure that has attributes that we see all across the landscape and we wanna see how that uh, distributes chronologically. So we'll talk more about that as I, I move forward. Um, so today I'm supposed to be introducing the Hearthstone project to you and this is a, a collaboration um, between myself um, at Shumla, um, and I'm a chemist, for those of you that don't know, I'm not an archeologist. Um, and so I really focus on archeological science. And then it's a collaboration between uh, myself and then Shumla's um, archeology span director, uh, Dr. Phil Daring, and um, Texas State University and Shumla's founder, Dr. Floyd. Um, this collaboration is, is really great. And, it, and what we're doing is we're, we're doing sort of three pillars of knowledge, uh, archeological science, indigenous knowledge, and uh, art analysis, formal art analysis. And so these three pillars um, are one of the reasons, not, there's many reasons we call the project the Hearthstone Project, um, but uh, if you're not familiar with that term in, um, Mesoamerican groups. Uh, the Hearthstone Project is um, based off of these three pillars of research. And the idea is that um, in uh, indigenous um, groups in Central Mexico and in the American Southwest, uh, the um, hearth is a very central part of the household. Um, and there's a lot of symbolic meaning with that. And there are three hearthstones, like a tripod is the most stable sort of structure. And this is where you would put your um, cooking surface on. Um, this later developed into the comal, um, where you would cook your tortillas and, and so forth. And so um, this is, is part of our analysis, but we really think it's this interdisciplinary nature of our work that is the way forward, um, that we're gonna learn the most about the rock art of the region. Um, this project is uh, supported um, partially through two grants that we were very honored to receive. Um, Carolyn and Phil are um, um, lead investigators 
on um, the National Endowment for Humanities grant. And then um, myself and Carolyn are investigators on the National Science Foundation grant. And we wrote these two proposals so that they could be woven together um, if we did in fact receive um, both of those projects, which we did. Um, the NEH grant really focuses on three monumental sites in the region, um, large sites, um, and that is Halo Shelter, Panther Cave, and Rattlesnake Canyon. And um, we'll talk some about what we'll be doing at those sites. The National Science Foundation grant will also include work at uh, Rattlesnake Canyon and Halo Shelter, um, but then we will also look at um, eight other smaller sites in the region, and it will really focus on the radiocarbon dating of the rock art. So um, for those of you that may or may not be familiar with us, you know, we're a nonprofit research center, and our uh, goal is um, our, our main mission is to preserve the rock art of this region. And we do that through um, three or four sort of arms, and that's documentation, research, stewardship, and education. And um, we really think that it requires all of these things um, to um, do the best preservation of the rock art. I'm just gonna go through these pretty quickly. If you're not familiar with where we're located, uh, we are in Southwest Texas at the confluence of the Pecos River and the Devil's River with the Rio Grande. Um, we're about, our office is about 30 miles west of Del Rio, Texas. Um, and this is where the rock art is located. And so we, you know, are mainly situated here so that we can go and do the field work, work with the community and, um, you know, be a part of that community and study the rock art. Um, this area does have some of the most complex, um, sort of compositionally intricate rock art uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and it's a, a perfect laboratory for um, the development of new techniques to study rock art. Um, and so we can learn not only about the rock art here, but the techniques that we're can developing can also be applied to other regions. Um, it's quite beautiful. Um, uh, many of you know that I'm from Arkansas and I miss trees. Um, because this is a sort of a desert landscape. Um, and if you're just driving west on the highway, a lot of people don't know that the rock art is here because it's kind of flat and uh, you don't see the canyons. You really have to get out on the ranches or in the state parks um, to see uh, really some of the most magnificent beauty um, of the region. Um, there are these limestone shelters, uh, limestone canyons here. And within them, there are thousands of these rock shelters. Um, and some of them are quite large for scale. There are people here at the bottom and climbing up along the fence line. Um, and so you can see that some of the sites are quite large. Um, there are others that are smaller. And both of these sites do have rock art in them. Um, you know, one of the sites I said that we're gonna focus on uh, with the NEH grant and the NSF grant is Rattlesnake Canyon. Um, it's one of the um, sort of more monumental sites of the area. It's 32 meters wide, very, very densely painted. Um, it's also um, under threat from flash flooding. Um, so uh, when there are floods, sometimes silt will rest on the bottom of the panel. And so it's one of the sites that we consider one of the most threatened in the area. So we want to study it as soon as it's possible. Other sites like the White Shaman are, I always say only eight meters, but I mean, if you think about eight meter sticks, that's really big. Um, so uh, just to give you a sense of scale. And then um, just showing you um, for people who have not seen the rock art of the area, um, these are large compositions. Um, this is Panther Cave, which is also going to be one of the sites uh, that we focus on um, with the NEH grant. So as part of the Hearthstone project. Uh, this is a close up of a portion of um, Rattlesnake Canyon. It's probably about a meter and a half to two meters wide, shown in the photograph just for scale. And again, you know, I like to point out intricacies in the figures. You have these two sort of human like figures facing each other. 
Um, this one has sort of what we would call a rabbit ear headdress, um, sort of two um, oblate shapes coming off of its head. Um, and of course, there's this wonderful splatter paint coming out of the mouth of this one and then crossing with the splatter paint out of the mouth of this other figure. Um, researchers have hypothesized that this is um, sound or speech or soul. And so when we are doing our forms and we're listing all the attributes that every figure has, uh, we call this speech breath um, so that we denote whether a figure has this or not. Um, and then this here is a nice, beautiful um, image of the white shaman shelter. Um, it's been um, interpreted to be associated with um, creation and renewal and also has um, a figure um, over um, on the left side of the panel that has deer antlers with black dots on the tine. So again, this is a repeated attribute um, that we're interested in across the uh, landscape. You know, I'm just kind of giving an intro and then we're gonna get into Hearthstone, um, but uh, the area is not just significant for the rock art, but uh, these rock shelters um, do contain some of the, the deposits in the rock shelters um, often don't get uh, wet. And so you get preservation of organic materials such as uh, woven mats and baskets and sandals. And so, you know, I really think that this is the best place to study hunter gatherers pretty much anywhere. Um, because you have um, their um, belief systems on and their artistic, beautiful murals on the walls. And then you have their stone tools and their bones um, from the animals and so forth that they ate. But you also have this perishable organic um, artifacts that are often not found um, in other places uh, that just don't get preserved. Um, the earliest dates for the region now go back to 13,000 years ago, and we do have continual occupation in the region um, until European contact when the Spanish arrived. Um, the rock art we don't have as old as dates on, and um, that's most likely due to the preservation of the shelter walls and the geology of the area. Um, but uh, and I'll say this really quickly. Right now, the Pecos River style we know uh, persisted from about 4,000 years ago all the way up until about 1,000 years ago. And so it, it persisted for about 3,000 years, that style of art that we're, we're really focusing on. Um, but those dates that we have are from about seven sites. Um, and there are over 350 rock art sites in the region. And so we really need to do more work to see if um, we're just seeing bias because we're looking at such a small sample of data. So, um, you know, I think that if you um, have read uh, my collaborator, Dr. Carolyn Boyd's um, book, she makes a very good argument that these are um, visual narratives that we can read and they have visual symbology. Um, I like to shape this because I think, um, you know, we have no problem looking at this picture on the bottom, this, this codices and saying, well, that's a book. It's a visual text. But um, just because this is painted on a wall doesn't mean anything different. It is a visual text that has symbolic information that has meaning. Um, and so I just like to say that there's very little difference between this on the top and this on the bottom. And, um, you know, we just completed a documentation initiative called the Alexandria Project. Um, and that took us four years. It took the team four years. And it was designed to sort of preserve digitally these panels. Um, with the same planning and efficiency that you would use to preserve books in a library. Um, you know, if you're um, a librarian, you might scan your books and so that you have them in a digital format. Um, and so um, that's what we've done with the rock art with the Alexandria project. And, um, you know, we finished that project um, just this, we're really still kind of finishing up the, um, data cleanup of that right now. Um, but that project was named for um, 
the Library of Alexandria in Egypt that burned. And the idea was that, um, you know, a lot of information was lost when that happened. And so here in the new world, we want to preserve um, these murals that we think communicate equally important information um, that talk about the philosophy and the religion and the biology and the, ever, the knowledge that the culture here had. Um, and so, um, you know, when we did that project, it was what we called level one or baseline documentation. So we did things like um, state of Texas archeology span forms, our own rock art site form. And then the sort of most visual part of that was the GigaPan um, photogrammetry and the 3D model photogrammetry um, that we did. And so um, the Hearthstone project would not be possible without um, that Alexandria project data. And because we're really building on that. Um, just to kind of give a quick overview of some of the things that we did was that we made a 3D model of um, over 254 sites in the region. And we also did um, gigapans for those sites. And so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about those. Um, when you make a 3D model, you're just moving your camera um, along the shape of the shelter and you're moving yourself over. So all of these blue squares are like camera views or camera shots and it's a supercomputer to stitch all of that together. Um, whereas the GigaPan is a little bit different. You put your very nice camera and very nice lens um, on a uh, robotic gimbal system and it's set in one place. So you're taking a photo of a three-dimensional object, but you end up with a planar surface. Um, so these two techniques, um, so you do get some distortion, but so in the top method, you get the shape of the shelter. In the bottom method, we get very high resolution detail. And so let's just kind of go through those. So this is um, a GigaPan, and these are all, most of these are publicly available. Um, GigaPan has a website, and if you just sort of search GigaPan and Shimla, um, these will pop up. We also have links on our website, um, but you can zoom in, and here you can see individual brush strokes. What this allowed us to do was have maps of the panels that we want to study for the Hearthstone project. So we have a digital map of those panels so that we can determine the research that we want to do. Um, here's just a 3D model. I don't have it where I can move it around, but um, I picked this one because it has a historic wooden structure in, so it's kind of interesting. Um, but this is from Quintero Shelter on the Devil's River State Natural Area, and there's rock art on the wall. Um, but you can move this around in space. And what's also really cool about these is you can do measurements on these um, from the figures. Okay, now I'm spending a lot of time talking about what we did for the Alexandria project. And that, again, as I said, that's because we could not do what we're doing now without that data. That data is um, allowing us to do a lot of work ahead of time before we go out in the field and then really focus on the work that's needed at those sites. So the first site we went to as part of the Hearthstone project was Halo Shelter. And we spent about three weeks um, there. Um, and it is on private land, but the landowners are, are very gracious about allowing researchers and others to come see these sites. And um, we uh, did a couple of things while we were there, uh, more than a couple. But uh, the main thing was that we reshot all of our figure photography. Um, we, we really needed that because we needed to, our ultimate goal is for Carolyn to produce an illustration of this panel. And so we really needed better photographs of each individual figure. Um, the other thing that we did in the main focus of the NEH and the NSF grant is um, Dynalite or digital microscopy. Um, and this is a, I'll show you another picture in a minute, but it is a little handheld microscope that you can hold against the wall and it has a cable that goes to a USB port and you can have a tablet or a laptop and you can take microscopy images so that you can start to see how the paint is layered onto the wall. Um, and so that was really one of our main goals. 
so, you know, kind of going back to my analogy with the Alexandria project that each of these sites is like a book and we just spent four years scanning all of the books. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pull that first book off the shelf and we're going to begin to read it and study it. Um, and so this halo is that first site um, that we are really focusing on. You know, we do have the scans, but there's information that's not in the photogrammetry, like the order in which the paint was applied to the wall. How old are the paintings? What is the paint made of? Those are things that you have to have the real deal to be able to study. So, um, kind of want to go back to this idea of the Hearthstone project and our three pillars. So one of the things that we're doing is um, formal art analysis. We're describing each figure, we're looking at where they're located on the panel and um, figuring out kind of how the composition is put together. Um, archaeological science composes things like I do, like radiocarbon dating and pigment analysis, and, and that's a big part of it, but it also includes the um, digital microscopy and um, taking all of those paint layers and figuring out how the panel was put together and then doing that um, in combination. The ultimate goal is to um, also end up with an illustration of the um, panel and we will take large scale photographs of the sites and um, those illustrations that um, Carolyn and Phil put together and then we want to take that to different Udo Aztecan um, speaking groups because we know that that's the language family based on the symbology in the art. Um, and the first group that they're going to take this to is the Lichol in uh, Mexico. Um, they're a group that was um, not as impacted by the Spanish. And so a lot of people um, look at their ethnography when looking at um, sort of central Mexican um, in northern Texas. Uh, uh, groups. So this is um, sort of our plan. So what we're really doing is level two and level three documentation of these sites. We're identifying all the figures at um, these three monumental sites. We're describing them. We're doing figure photography and we are doing microscopy to see how the paint was applied to the wall. Um, that will go into something called a Harris matrix. And then that will help us select the best samples for radiocarbon dating. So I kind of want to go through that really quickly. Um, so again, here is our nice fancy little microscope. Um, and you can see here in this example, and this is actually at Rattlesnake, um, you can see that the red paint is applied on top of the black in this instance. And so um, you do this at like, I think at Halo, we spent, I think we got about 350 locations where we did this um, microscopy. Um, and so we have all of this paint layering. Um, we have a couple of different people who look at this and make their determinations. And then they feed that into a flow chart that's called a Harris matrix. Um, we do actually do uh, each color in each figure because at the White Shaman site, Carolyn has shown that it was painted by color, not by figure. So all the black was painted first, then the red, and then the yellow, and then the white. What we don't know is if that applies to other sites, how, how many other sites in the region. And so, um, you know, here I'm just showing a simple example with three, but there will be this humongous flow chart for Halo that has, um, I think I forgot how many figures, it has a couple hundred um, figures, and we will have this um, so the idea is that then we will pick a figure that we're super interested in, like the one on my title slide with the um, red deer antlers and the black dots, and we will say, okay, we're going to maybe radiocarbon date that figure, but then we're going to look at what figures that one is in paint layering, in stratigraphy, and superimpositioning with, and we will also sample the very top paint layer and also the very bottom paint layer so that we can kind of testing our method and seeing you know are we getting stratigraphic ages um, you know if it's a composition and they were all painted at the same time all three of those ages should be statistically indistinguishable 
but um, if it is um, a painting sequence over time, you know, we'll get an older age on the bottom and a younger age on the top. And so it doesn't matter which result we get. That's what science is, is you have a hypothesis and you test it. Um, but either way, the knowledge that we get is just going to be super exciting. This can all be fed into um, an illustration of the site. This was a working illustration um, for the site so that we could mark all the locations that we needed to do um, our microscopy and our figure photography and kind of keep track. Um, and this really helps to have this done kind of before you're on site. And again, this is done using the Alexandria data set. Um, and this is just us with the map again, working a halo. Um, I would just, okay, so I'm, I'm so, I'm not sure, I wanna make sure I kind of explain the Hearthstone project really quick before I kind of show some stuff at the end here. So our goal is to um, do art analysis, describe all the figures that we're going to study, um, and then do the digital, so that's our art analysis. So archeological science is the digital microscopy um, and figuring out the order in which the paint is applied to the wall and then radiocarbon dating those different paint layers. Um, then Carolyn will create an illustration and we will take um, both the photographs of the sites and those illustrations to uh, Udo Aztec and indigenous groups um, that we're building relationships with and get their um, knowledge. Um, what symbols do they recognize um, from this art? And so that, that is the Hearthstone project. And we're, we're just super excited about um, that uh, sort of interdisciplinary nature of the research. Um, so as we start this new research project, um, I do wanna add that Chimla is opening a second office on the Texas State University campus in San Marcos. Uh, and this will allow us to train more students and have more access to research collaborations. Um, I will still keep my lab and office in Comstock where the rock art's located, but this is an exciting move for us. Um, and for those of you that don't know, I kind of want to stress that we are a private nonprofit and we are not associated with the university. We're just renting space from Texas State, um, but it's a really good um, partnership for us to be there. Um, I do have interns um, that work both in the field and in the archaeological chemistry lab with me. Um, so uh, we, we take sort of different levels. Uh, Dr. Lori Barkwell Love had just completed her uh, PhD in anthropology when she came and worked in the lab. Um, and then Jesse uh, is a chemistry student, uh, undergraduate student. So we take all kinds. Um, and so uh, that's something we do. Um, we also work with the local high school um, and uh, the, the high school here is really small. So there's about 10 students in the class this year. Um, and they do get to work uh, with me in the lab and I go to them sometimes and they get to work on projects. Um, so we're really excited about that collaboration. Um, this is just, these are really fun pictures for me. They're helping me build a, a new plasma oxidation instrument that we just completed last year in the lab. This is all high vacuum technology equipment um, and they're, they were great help. Um, it would have taken me twice the time to do it uh, without their help. And I think they learned a lot in the process. Um, and here it is operating and, and we are processing paint samples for radiocarbon dating. We use a technique called plasma oxidation to extract the organic material from the paint to get dates. I would also say, um, you know, we have um, a really wonderful website and a uh, research blog. And this is an older screenshot. I should have taken a new one because today, if you go to the research tab, there's a new tab now that says Hearthstone. And so um, you can read about uh, the Hearthstone project um, there. And we have a very active social media presence if you're into that. We have a wonderful operation, uh, operations manager who's really good at doing all of this. And this is a wonderful team that I work with day in and day out. This was day one of going down into Halo. Look how happy they look. And I'll end there and hopefully get to answer some questions. So thank you for your attention. There we go. Hi guys. Stin of this style. Um, 
so the the um, archaeological region is defined by the extent of this particular style of art. Um, we have. I'm trying to. I have a map here at the beginning that is just easier to share this way. Um, there are other styles of rock art in this region besides the Pegas River style. But so this sort of um, brown area on this map um, is kind of the extent. Um, most of it is in Valverde County, um, which is, oh gosh, I don't know if I can draw Valverde County on here, but it's like right here. And then um, there are a few sites that are in the county to the west of us, and there are sites in Northern Mexico as well. Um, the Northern Strange, um, you know, it doesn't go all the way to Ozona. So it's just this, this area, you know, there's people who've made analogies to the style to other areas. Um, but this particular style is sort of found in that region. Um, I saw, Kel so hopefully that helps. Kelsey, I saw you had your hand raised. Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm Kelsey Hansen. I'm a PhD candidate at the School of Anthropology at the University of Arizona. I actually have two questions, if you don't mind. Uh, first question is, so plasma excavation for radiocarbon dating mm -hmm. is really, really cool. I was curious, um, does Juno accept outside samples for this processing, or like, are there other places that do this uh, as well? So yes, I do work with archaeologists kind of all over the world um, with collaboration. So um, right now I'm working um, on a project in California. Um, and I'm working on a project in uh, Montana uh, with Larry Lowendorf. Um, I have worked with Australians, people in South America. It, a lot of it, though, is, you know, talking about collaborations with grant funding and so forth. Um, so, yeah, um, it's kind of interesting. I'm in a unique position here because mm -hmm. um, I kind of do this unique thing of dating rock art. Um, and so, you know, our mission is to preserve the rock art of the Lower Pecos, and that is my main focus. But I do side projects um, because it's important to understand the um, relationships of this art to other art in surrounding areas. And I also, this is an excellent place to sort of develop these techniques that can then be applied um, to other regions. Um, and so, um, I mean, I'm just in my own playground here because there's so much amazing things to study, but I hope that, you know, these techniques can be used um, for others. So if you're interested in a collaboration, please uh, reach out to me. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> and my second question, I was just curious if, um, if you could expand upon the uh, indigenous knowledge portion of this mm -hmm. project, the Arsis project. You mentioned that you were working with the Huichol community. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about this, like for example, um, how are you identifying, like, who in the community to talk with or work with? Um, so, what are the goals of this interaction? Yeah, I should have also said um, that another PI on the NEH grant is uh, Stacey Schaefer mm -hmm. and her husband, because I'm not on that grant. Um, my collaborator, Carolyn Boyd, is. Um, but, uh, you know, it is a very large part of what we're doing as a team. Mm -hmm. um, the uh they have lived among the weechels for like the past 25 or 30 years um and they have access to both sort of um i'm not as familiar with the weechel as i am some other indigenous groups around the world like i've done a lot of work with um aboriginal cultures in australia but um I, my understanding is that there is women's knowledge and men's knowledge and so having both of them as a part of this project um is very crucial and important um, and so it's really, you know, those relationships that they have built um, over the years. Um, I do know that um, several years ago, Weechel Shaman did come to the Lower Pecos um, and was invited and, and saw the rock art. Um, and uh, he could recognize the symbology in the rock art. Um, I kind of make the analogy of like, um, realism painting versus impressionist painting, like the mm -hmm. style of art is different, but the symbols in the art are very, very similar. Um, so, you know, um, if you look at Weechel art, you know, it looks different 
But if you look at the symbols that are in the art, it, it's very similar. Um, I think this idea comes back to this idea of an archaic core of beliefs that would have been shared. And then as groups became different groups, um, those ideas changed and expanded, but there was a core of symbols that would have stayed the same. Um, and that, that this is something that a lot of, I'm not, you know, I'm a chemist, but I work with archeologists who study this. This is like the theories of like um, uh, Lopez Austin in uh, central Mexico and so forth that, um, you know, have studied these different groups and see similarities between them. Um, so it was amazing. I mean, to me that he could look at this art and he could know the names of the different mm -hmm. figures in his, his belief system. Now this art is 4,000 years old. So I'm, we're not saying that it's that figure. We're saying that there is a core belief that developed into um, his belief system and that you can make analogy um, based on that. So um, I don't know, I, I kind of went, I veered a little there, but uh, um, yeah, the, they're very excited. They're gonna be going and spending, um, Carolyn and Phil, um, the archeologists will be spending about six months uh, with the Weechel um, over a period of a couple of years, um, you know, total. They'll, they'll kind of go for a few months and then come back and then go. Um, and we're really excited because, you know, the only site that we know um, that, that we've taken a Weechel person to is the White Shaman site. And so looking at these other sites and seeing um, what imagery um, they recognize. I will say also, we have a um, Mexican archeologist working with us now. Her name is uh, Dr. Diana Radio Rolon. And um, she is doing a postdoc with Carolyn, but she has a lot of knowledge of Aztec and Maya. And so she's really able to recognize symbology. Um, you know, we're, again, we're not saying that, you know, this is Aztec or Maya, but we're looking for these core symbols that are um, consistent across groups in the Americas. So it's exciting. Totally, totally. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to see what comes of this. Mm -hmm. Just kind of following up on that, my question about the geographical extent, have the archaeologists been looking at the archaeology to see whether there are diagnostic artifacts that might uh, give some information about the extent of the culture? Well, yeah. Um, the problem is is when you have Sotol and Lechequia and you have the same plants and the environment's the same, you're going to have the same types of mats and the same types of sandals and you're going to have they do look at stone tools and distribution um, there is change over that 13,000 years I want to be very clear um, and the climate did change um, periodically as well um, there was more grasslands at certain times and it was more dry and desert like at other times um, and so um, really tying that and that's why it's so important to date the rock art, because if we don't know exactly when the rock art was produced, then we can't connect it to what's in the ground. We have to be able to, um, you know, think of this as an artifact like any other. And it's not archaeology and rock art. It is archaeology. And the rock art is one arm of that archaeology to study. Um, and so... Um, you know, we are specialists, just like there are lithic specialists and there are, you know, weaving specialists. But um, uh, Phil Daring is really looking at, like, things like climate studies and um, the excavations that have been done in this area so that when we do get more finely refined dates on the art that we'll get from the Hearthstone Project, I mean, you know, if somebody says, how old is Pecos River style? I can say, well, it's from 4,000 to 1,000 years old, but that's a very large range. Um, and we need to be able to narrow that down into, and, and I'm getting a little bit off your question. I'll get back to it in a second. Um, like if you recognize, I'm making an analogy again. If you see Egyptian art, you go, oh, that's Egyptian art. You recognize it. But if you study Egyptian art, you'll know the difference between new kingdom and old kingdom and some of the different reigns and so forth. 
um, the, the sub periods um, within that. And that's what we want to be able to do with Pecos River style art because it did persist for so long. We want to know, um, you know, did they make the certain kind of style figures like the ovoid shapes versus the rectangular shapes? Is that a chronological thing or is that a symbolic geographical thing? Um, there's so much we don't know. Um, but back, so I guess my question is, it's really important that we get those fine radiocarbon dates so that we can relate it to what is in the ground, what is in the archeology. span um, But as far as the extent, I mean, if you're just doing excavations and you're looking at burned rock bins with earth ovens, you see that all the way out to El Paso and you see it all the way up north until it turns into more grasslands. And, you know, yes, that's a wider distribution. So the rock art is centered in an area where there are three rivers that come together. And so one hypothesis that you can make of that is that this might have been a gathering place um, where you know different groups would have come. But that's a total hypothesis, and I'm not an archaeologist. These are really hard questions that even archaeologists would struggle with that y'all are asking. Um, but I would say that yes, we need to look at that thing, and we need to start thinking of rock art as a regular part of archaeology, and not something separate. Um, I'm really struck by the choice of these three sites. You know, it always makes me wonder uh, among the hundreds, the I think 320 or 340 among all those sites, you know, these these three. And uh, clearly it, here we have very well preserved uh, uh, paintings and, and uh, visual depictions and, and ex a lot to work with, you know, extensive murals. Um, uh, the only shelter that I've been to uh, among these three is Halo, and it just blew me away. I was just uh, astounded by it. I still can't get over it. I, I remember looking at it feeling like something like this just can't exist. It's just impossible. And there I, I was looking at it, <laughs> which is interesting. But, uh, but anyway, one of the, one of the, uh, so, you know, so I'm uh, interested in what what kinds of similarities run through these murals and uh, and uh, how they relate to one another. And one aspect of that of that curiosity is has to do with acoustics. So uh, so Vicki Roberts uh, explained that uh, that Halo Shelter has very, very particular acoustic properties and we could hear them. You know, we could standing there in front of the, the, the mural, we could uh, uh, hear the way that the sound just ricocheted uh, in, in fascinating ways. And I'm just wondering about the acoustic properties of panther and rattlesnake and wondering if there, if there are special acoustic features there as well. Um, there usually are, I know when you have these parabolic structures, you know, often that will affect the sound. But I was just wondering if they were as pronounced as they are in Halo and if the Hearthstone project will include Kind of an exploration as to how sound might have played a role in the life in the lives of the people of the lower pecos canyon lands in relation to this art so you know might there have been music uh that uh, accompanied ceremonies at halo uh and uh and is that kind of question th that aspect of the culture uh will that be part of the hearthstone project so that was kind of a mouthful but i hope that makes sense <laughs> yeah so Yes, parabolic shapes often have acoustic properties. Many rock art sites, not only in the Lower Pecos, but all around the world have acoustic properties. Um, there are people who specialize in just that and sort of often are physics type people who are interested in sound waves and that kind of thing. Um, it is something that we made note of when we visited all of these sites for the Alexandria project, if there was echoes or, um, you know, where you could whisper on one side of the shelter and, and hear it perfectly clear on the other. Um, I do, per I mean, it's a hypothesis, you know, uh, I do think that people were performing ceremonies in these sites and, and also, you know, um, just a part of daily life. Uh, I think we separate daily life and ceremony in our world, but hunter-gatherers tend to not do that. Everything is interwoven and, and part of the same thing. Um, as far as like how we selected these sites, a lot of it had to do with 
threatened nature of the site and um, the imagery that was in the site. Um, I would also say Hilo is in some ways things around the Devil's River kind of have their own look. Um, that's a gut feeling. Um, and so I would say that, um, you know, we wanted to make sure we included a site from that area. Um, because Halo is, to me, when I look at it, I say, oh, that's very different. But that's just a gut. Um, but then when you start to look at the attributes of the figures, you're like, well, it's got the same kind of thing going on. Um, and so um, I don't know if it's that different except maybe what it's trying to convey. Um, because we do think that that site has a lot to do with chaos and motion and creation and that stuff that we're learning through um, our um, postdoc, uh, uh, Diana, who is looking at um, that iconography there. Um, I'm trying to think, you asked something else. What did I forget? Oh, that's fine. I <laughs> I was realizing as I was speaking that I was asking probably too many questions. So, uh, so that's that's really fascinating. Thank you so much, Karen. I I just can't wait to see what what unfolds in this project. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, we have one more question in the chat. I see. Um, what is the material and culture of these prehistoric people? What kind of stone tools and its technology? Um, so um, the bow and arrow arrives very late to this area, about a thousand A.D. Um, so uh, for um, hunting, they're using atlatls or spear throwers. So there are stone tools that are a little bit larger that go on the, the shaft um, of a dart. Um, we have a lot of ground stone um, where there are mortars, um, where there was processing of plants. Um, there are, um, in the organic materials that are preserved, we have a lot of woven mats. Um, we have sandals. Um, there are twine and rope. We have all that kind of stuff that's preserved going back very old. Um, there is, you know, they do not have ceramics. There's no ceramics in this, this area until very late and very little. Um, so they were mainly using basketry to transport things um, and store things. Um, we do have interesting shaped mortars. We have sort of some that were just more like grinding patches. We have some that you can stick your whole arm down in, um, you know, and there are different hypotheses about those. Um, so it was, it was a small groups probably, um, you know, th there's still a lot of debate on the size of the groups that would have moved from area to area. Um, and then uh, there still needs to be a lot of work on, you know, were they doing seasonal rounds um, and, and how far were those um, distribution patterns, um, how long did it take them to come back to a site? Um, I mean, there's a million, I could come up with, you know, 30 research projects in five minutes probably for someone just because there's a lot we know, but there's a lot we don't know. Do you have any uh, updates on uh, any of the, the paint um, dating? So um, I'm trying to think. So we published a paper this year and it's got some new dates and I think you've seen that one. Um, we don't have anything new yet, but I will say that we will probably have new data by the beginning of the year. Um, I've got stuff in the lab and I'm wishing like i'm excited to visit my family next week but part of myself wants to be here processing samples next week um but uh we will have i think dates um for um we we have samples from jack jackrabbit and jaguar um so um we're hoping we have not sampled at halo yet that's something we um are hoping to do um in the next month or so uh, so it's it's an ongoing process, you know, it, it's a two to three year project that, that will take us, um, but the plan is to get 60 radiocarbon dates, new ones for the region. And they will be very targeted um, on specific figures, specific attributes. Um, we're still narrowing down that list, because um, I said there are eight other smaller sites that we're also going to do besides the three major ones. And so we're trying to decide, do we want to focus on things like, I don't know, horned serpents, because that sounds pretty cool to me, or, you know, 
rabbit ear figures or deer antler figures or um, portals or box with legs or, you know, there's so many attributes in this rock art and so many things that 60 dates is like, wow, we can date everything. And actually we can't. And so we've got to really think about what research questions we have. And um, the problem is we had a gazillion research questions. So we're narrowing those down to um, be able to really focus on some things. Thank you. Um, last uh, lunch we had, uh, we, you had one of your archaeologists talking about the winged figures. And uh, I was curious, I, I have some questions for her, but I, I was wondering, is she out in Comstock or is she somewhere else? No, she's in Comstock. She's just over there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Next time I'm out, I'll pop in. Yes. Stop by and talk to Audrey. Yeah. Wanted to thank everybody for attending today. We'll, well, again, we will send a recording by this afternoon. We'll get a recording of this. Um, any questions you've got, there's, a, there's an email at the bottom of that. Send those away. Always glad to hear from people get new ideas. Um, that, that helps us along too. So thank you very much and hope to see you in a future Lunch and Learn.